Thank you. Well, we've got uh, economists, actuaries, politicians, accountants. Well, let's not forget the people. One of the reasons I ran for Congress, motivated by a great firm, Arthur Anderson. I spent 22 years of my life at Arthur Anderson. And let's not forget that Chuck Bowser came out of Arthur Anderson. David Walker came out of Arthur Anderson. I came out of Arthur Anderson. The firm had a tremendous... And after that, it just... Well, that, you know, that's one of the problems. And by the way, that's prosecutorial hubris when you have people going after a firm with 50,000 employees when they could have gone after three partners in Houston for Enron, and then it goes to the Supreme Court and wins 9 to 0, but the firm's reputation was killed. Yeah. That happens to individuals, by the way, as well as firms. And there's a lesson to be learned in that. That's not for this session, but uh, let me remind you of the greatness of this firm. Because it not only spawned great people, it spawned great ideas. And I want to remind you where you came from. The FASAB was formed as a result of the bill that I introduced in Congress twice. In 1986 and 1987, President Bush signed the law, and because we saw in Arthur Anderson, before he came to Congress, a need for generally accepted accounting principles at the federal level. And I didn't understand that we would have a separate FASAB to do that, but we understood there needed to be a bigger focus for that. Now, one of the things that happened that induced me to make that great decision to leave the firm, not knowing I could be elected, by the way, and when you're in an accounting firm, you have to leave before you run, otherwise the public thinks that you're now being supported by the firm and you know the independence that these firms have. So I left and, thank God, I was lucky enough to win as a Republican in the Democratic district. I tell many of my friends I was the accidental congressman because if my party knew I would win, they wouldn't put me up. I was a sacrificial lamb. And I fooled them by winning. But now I'm here with four years of great experience in Congress on the Banking Committee and the Government Operations Committee. They've changed the name somewhat. But before that, I was one of the partners on a team led by Harvey Kaplan that was hired by the Treasury Department to undo the books or to redo the books of New York City so that the Treasury Department would feel comfortable in bailing New York City out. And once we did that, I guess it was Felix Roy Hayden that was running it at the time. I think we still need him today, by the way. Uh, and uh, once we did that, Mr. Kapnick was smart enough, following the footsteps of Mr. Spotcheck, who built the firm. I'm going to quote something from him. His 250 speeches over 20 years put in this book. Uh, we decided that why not take this team of partners, including me and Mr. Mort Eagle, who had a lot to do with the publication of these books. Just had dinner with him last week one of our great partners, and see if we can piece together the financial statements of the United States of America. So the firm, on its own nickel, prepared the consolidated financial statements of the United States of America and published it in this book in 1975, Sound Financial Reporting in the Public Sector. They followed up in the next year, Sound Financial Management in the Public Sector, 75, 76. The firm did that for, I guess, five years and then turned it over to the Treasury. And this became a prototype statement, then prepared by the Treasury. And today, you have it. Okay. And by the way, I came down a day early yesterday so I could read. Thanks for Wendy. I got a hard copy of the financial statements of the United States of America. And I did read this yesterday. And let me tell you, we need a better format, <laughs> as David Walker said. But when you think about the exercise this farm went through, and then you think about the Treasury picking it up. And now I'm reading this statement, and the first thing that hits me is we don't have a liability for Social Security on the books. Now, when I asked one of your staff, because I couldn't understand, I could understand that, all right, we didn't want to project the 54 or 55 trillion. I still believe there has to be a liability, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And I'll quote from Arthur Anderson when we prepare this book. But I couldn't understand, well, why didn't we put the non-public debt on? And the answer to me was, well, we used consolidated principles, and therefore we eliminated that four point something trillion in consolidation, the liability and the trust fund. I said, boy, is that a silly answer? No, not, I'm not yeah, castigating the staff, but I'm saying, that doesn't meet common sense or fiscal reality. You have to have at least the bonded debt 
even though a big part of it is public, on the books of the United States of America. And if you have to do it by calling it deferred income, so be it. You belong to country clubs and private clubs. You pay your dues in advance. They can't put that in income. They have to set it aside to match those revenues against the expenditures. I mean, that's a simple accounting principle. Why anybody would say that that shouldn't apply to this is beyond me. But let me give you the answer that Arthur Anderson had in insisting, this is 1975, why they put the full accrual for Social Security on the books. And by the way, if you don't have these, I'd be pleased to make copies and send them back down to you because I think there's a lot here that great minds have come up with. <coughs> I was only a younger partner at the time, but I learned a lot at the at the knee of Leonard Spotcheck and, 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 and uh, what's his name, uh, Harvey Kaplick and Morty. And here is note 13, accrued Social Security to the prototype statement, Consolidated Financial Statements of America. And by the way, I did come here to speak mainly about fiscal sustainability, but this seems to be getting a lot of your attention. I figured let me lead off with this. An accrual for Social Security benefits is reflected in the company, accompanying financial statement because it appears that such benefits could not be terminated or substantially curtailed without serious social and political implications. Social Security receipts and disbursements are also included in the unified budget. Further, in principle, the consolidated financial statements and the accumulated deficit should reflect a liability for the amount of future benefits that will not be covered by future contributions under present law. Under this principle, inclusion of an accrual would seem to be both proper and required. It is recognized that the Social Security Act states that payments should be made only to the extent of the trust funds and that covered individuals who have not contributed to the fund have no contractual right to receive benefits. However, this does not negate the need to accrue a liability. I could go on and on and give you what the compromise was and, and how they decided to put it on in a staged way. But I think this is a very important issue. The other important issue is the 800-pound gorilla that's not in this room. It's over there in Congress, and it's over there in the Treasury Department. And you are, in effect, a hostage to that. Because this organization, unlike the proposal I had in my bill, is now funded by some of the people who have a conflict of interest in the things that we are doing here today. The Treasury Department, I understand, gives you 25% of your budget. Congress for the CBO gives you 25, and there's another two entities. I'm not saying that that is wrong, but there is a perception that the rules that you are making here could be influenced if one of those bodies did not like the end result. And I saw that firsthand, because when I came up with the concept of a chief financial officer, which evolved starting with the accounting profession, because it had emerged from Arthur Anderson and was discussed in a committee with several others, and I brought it to Congress, there was an intention that the CFO would not be subject to politics. That the CFO, not just the deputies, would be extremely qualified individuals, and the CFO would not be part of the Treasury Department, would not be part of Congress, but would act in a separate way, whether it's something like David Walker, a 15-year term, not coterminous with anybody's election, or something like the Fed, where accounting would be divorced from politics once and for all. And that concept was first exposed by Leonard Spotcheck in one of his 250 speeches where he saw the need for this concept in the private sector when companies were trying to game the system and picking alternative accounting principles, whether it be depreciation, the way in those days they accounted for the investment tax credit. Some took it in income, some didn't. And he said the only answer is an accounting court. We must come up with a body that is going to take away the promulgation of accounting printed the principles and standards from the people who are in conflict with that. I come here today, not to tell you this is my final stop, this is my first stop. I am now the spokesman 20 years after leaving Congress for truth in government. That's what I do as a volunteer. You might say, how do I make a living? I'm on the boards of private companies that are preparing to go public, so I do make a living as a CPA. But I spent 22 years in Arthur Anderson, four years in Congress, and now 20 years as a public advocate for fiscal responsibility, and decided to write a book that would knock people off their seats. This was not an easy book to write, and I used somewhat exaggerated and outrageous terms, because if we can't get the people 
to do something about what's happening, all your work is for naught. Which gets me to another problem you have. I read the statement. What this statement doesn't do is consider the many constituencies that you have for financial information. You have the people. You have the press. You have the political elite that hopefully will make decisions based on good information. And um, you have sophisticated users, economists, actuaries, academics that need it. So you need to address that. You need to, in some way, come up with financial information that is targeting those people so they can use it for whatever they need. That is one of the reasons that one of the bills that I put in, and I think it was 1988, was a bill to, um, and I have it in my brochure. Do you have an extra copy of my brochure? Yes. Yeah, here it is. No? Yeah. Uh, was a bill to mandate that the Treasury Department distribute a simple one pager with the tax returns that they would send to all the taxpayers. You want our money? Tell us how you spent it. Now, you would think that this was an easy thing to do. And, and I even designed something, and you probably saw it in the brochure I gave you. Uh, probably, maybe it's not in this one. But I designed a, the budget and the accounting information in the form of a credit card statement because I realized most people don't own shares of stock. If they do, they do indirectly in their pension systems. So I said, what about starting off, this is your balance due at the beginning of the year, your share of the national debt. You can do it by family, you can do it by individual, you can do it by, you know, several ways. And now we add, what do we purchase for you? Your share of defense, social security. You go right down the line, all the major items disaggregated. Then there's the finance charge, your share of the interest on the national debt. Oh, and by the way, before we get to that, what did you pay us? Here's your share of excise taxes, income taxes, payroll taxes, and then we end at the bottom with a reconciliation, beginning to the end. Here's your new share of the national debt at the end of the year. Now, it's not perfect, but it was a way to convey to the public that the deficits were creating additional debt that has to be paid by someone in your family. And maybe it should be a family thing, because the family goes on as individuals disappear. And, and maybe that's the way it, it should be handled. But the answer from the Treasury was it would be too expensive to include that one piece of paper with the 100 million tax returns that we would send out. So in effect, again, politics trumped common sense. Obviously, they didn't want to do it because they didn't want you to see. Politicians have gained the system. And let me tell you how they've done it. There are many accountants here. What is the operating cycle of the United States of America. I was the chairman of an AGA, Association of Government, America, uh, Government Accountants Task Force, 1993. After I wrote the book, they called me in, how do we change it, Joe? Not going to be easy. But appoint me to a task force, I'll be chairman, Truth in Budgeting and Accounting. And you'll see in here the four-page recommendation, mainly the budget process. Now, I know from your staff, they said, you know, we're not mandated to cover the budget process. And I can understand that, but I say why? Because you have an operating cycle that is three to four years. And what we're talking about here is the end of the cycle. It starts with budgeting, then it starts with accounting, then it starts with spending, and then it has reporting. That's your operating cycle. Now, if you don't take generally accepted accounting principles and reflect them in the budget process, the cats are out of the house. When you go on vacation, if you have four cats, I try to do it. It's very difficult to get four cats back in the house once you last let them out. What we have done is we've let the politicians now determine through the budget process what the accounting principles are, what the commitments are, and by the time it comes down the line to you where we're preparing financial statements, you're basically, you know, dealing with a foundation that's very porous, as I said in my written comments to you. And I'm not saying this has to change tomorrow, but we need to understand that if you don't integrate accrual concepts, generally accepted accounting principles, and I assume there'll be some modifications for the federal government, into the budget process, then the financial reporting process is meaningless. Because you've already spent the money, you've already committed it. Now, what you have to do is disclose it. Now, hopefully, with fiscal sustainability, we can point the way to the future get the public interested in what went on at the beginning of that cycle, 
so that they will then enter the system. Because I think the most valuable thing that you are doing, and by the way, I agreed with most, and I did submit my comments. I hope you got them all, uh, and I'll be happy to, you know, repeat them if you want, but I think they're there for you to understand. Uh, and, but what you're doing that's most valuable is you're trying to give information to the most important constituency of all, the people. And why is that important? Because unless they get informed, and unless they get motivated, and in some cases angry, you're not going to get the changes we need to stop the tsunami that is being created right now that will dwarf the next generations. I've listened to The Economist, and they can talk all they want about the economic terms. You've got to go back to accounting. I mean, it's just incredible, some of the things. And let me now take the time to tell you who I disagree with and why I disagree with them. Rather, okay. I, I was going to actually frame that just a little bit different. We have your written comments, and as you indicated, you agreed with on the projection or sustainability report, <laughs> most of what we have there. I was going to ask you to respond to some of the issues, particularly the issues since you say appropriately that the most important people we're trying to, you know, communicate with is the citizens. There have been a number of comments including one that this will just be confusing if you show the chart that you have. And I'll go, go ahead and respond, but I'm, we're, we're most considered, we're most interested in how we can improve what we're doing to respond to the citizens and others. Okay. Well, let me just, in, in five minutes, tell you uh, okay. what I think. Go ahead and run ten. We started yeah. you a little bit late. We'll, we'll, we'll go to yeah. five after. Well, I'm supposed to go on to 1215, I think. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I'll keep, keep going. Sorry. Don't shortchange an account, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It didn't add up. <laughs> Sorry. It's quite a it's okay. <laughs> uh, Walker said that he doesn't see the need to record the unfunded liabilities. But he's right on the money when he says it's ridiculous that we're not putting the entire bond of debt on the books, and that's something you need to address. Uh, whether you call it deferred, whether you need to have deferred revenue to do it, has to be addressed. <clears throat> but I disagree with him uh, that there is no exchange. He's looking at a concept that maybe he became familiar with in, in the government and he forgot what he learned at Arthur Anderson. Uh, this, this concept of, of an exchange is, is a valid concept. And he's saying that if you can't show there was something exchanged for it, services, for benefits that it should not be recorded. I can't agree with that. We have politicians running around using rhetoric like accountability, transparency, they throw these terms around, and they throw the terms around lockbox trust fund. People have taken them at their word. People have voted for them. There's been an exchange of political capital here, moral capital, not necessarily financial capital. And the title of Mr. Spotcheck's book, where he put all those speeches together, is Fairness. Fairness in accounting and in financial reporting. That's the key word. Are we being fair to the next generation and to other constituencies by not indicating what the real liability is? Because we've promised it. Now, I heard the economist, he says, well, we can't fund this. If you're, no one's talking about funding 53 trillion. We're talking about reporting it putting it on the books where we can see it, and not disguising it. Put it right where it can be seen. If you need a footnote to explain it a little bit, do it. But you need to record it. So I disagree with Mr. Walker. We have something called moral capital and political capital. It's been spent, it's been extended, and that's why we need to record. And by the way, he should be the last one to talk, because every time his foundation takes out an ad in the paper, they're putting in front of your nose, and these are big two-page ads, in the New York Times, 53 trillion. Now he's up to, you just gave me the, the, that article from the Washington Post, 56 trillion. Now you can't speak out of both sides of your mouth. If you're gonna advertise to the public that this is what the debt is, we're not saying funding. Let's not confuse funding with reporting, that you've gotta record it as such, and he knows that political reality better than most. Okay, uh, now the other issue, the economist very neatly says, you don't have to worry about anything. Because if we have deficits, we have bonds, the money comes back to the public, it's a wash. It sounds like the consolidated financial statement, statement principles. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, inane result. What he failed to tell you 
is that we don't spend all of our money in the United States. We're in a global economy now. So his one and one equals two doesn't, it's not, it's not the answer. Because we don't know how much of what we're borrowing is being spent abroad. We know that we had the Iraq war. So we're not benefiting from that. And one of the other important things that you need to do with this statement that I put in my answers to you is recognize that the most important thing in the future for us is, is the United States going to be competitive? Is the United States going to win this global battle now that we're in a global economy so we don't become a hostage to China and Japan? And we are almost there with the respect to the money that we borrowed, and I hope we continue to borrow, but somehow we've got to break that that chain because it's not the right thing. If we want to be the leader of the free world, we cannot be a hostage to other nations. So therefore, one of the questions you asked was, should we report on the foreign debt? Absolutely, loud and clear, put it in there graphically. And I think you've concluded the same thing. You need to show that. But there are other things. What is the expenditures for national defense of the United States compared to other countries? We need to find things that show us that while we may be in a deep deficit now, that we are competitive enough because of these factors that we're going to come out of it. But if we're spending an inordinate amount of our money on defense, not being reimbursed by others, Iraq may never pay us back, this has to be understood because that's going to reduce the competitiveness of the United States of America. Another individual said, I think the prior speaker, well, you know, it is what it is. We used to have three kids in a family, now we have two. I don't accept that. We still have an obligation. But if you want to think about it in positive terms, what you do is think about what made this country great to begin with. How did we overcome all these deficits? And how did we overcome this national debt without going under so far? Although we're thinking that this could be a problem in the future. We are the most productive country in the world. We have a technology edge that put us there. And productivity offset all the waste that you've seen and many of these deficits. So who's to say in the future if we do the right things and we need to report where we stand before we can do the right things? That's why your role is so important. Who's to say that two people cannot become free with technology? So the issue is not to look at just the size of the family. Look at the potential of two people to become three, four, five, and six if we are competitive and if we allow them the tools they need in order to produce, and produce a technological term, <coughs> Microsoft, Google. That's what's keeping this country ahead of the game. And, and we need to give them information to do that. So with that, let me go back just to conclude. And I'll take any questions you want. You're going to hear a lot more from me because I'm taking truth and government now public. You're going to become a. Uh, and I just spoke to David Walker, and Mr. Peterson's thinking the same thing, that you need, it's not enough just to inform people. Uh, you need to create a grassroots lobby, just like Howard Jarvis did in the 70s with Proposition 13. And I'm going to now convert truth in government to a 501c4. He's going to do the same thing. And we're going to make sure your information gets to the right people so they can act on it. Because without them acting on it, uh, nothing is going to change. So let me just now go back. I took some notes over coffee this morning, I'm not going to go through those, but I got my mind in a good perspective for this meeting. And I think that we need to be careful. As I said, too many people are throwing around the words accountability and transparency, and they don't know what they mean. You can't have accountability without good accounting and good financial management system. You can't have transparency if you're going to throw a book like this at anybody and said, hey, we reported to you. And let me tell you what happened to me as a new congressman in 1985. A senior member, after I kept showing my voting card, you know, up saying this is the most expensive credit card in the world. I don't know whether you know that a voting card is the same shape as a credit card. So I kept every speech I gave, I took it out of my pocket to remind my colleagues, you are passing on debt to the next generation, and much of it is not reported. Your voting card is the most expensive credit card in the world. That's why I put it on the book. Credit line unlimited. Expiration date never, built to future generations. But what I told them at that time was this, this senior member comes to me and says, Joe, we get this quarterly. The clerk puts it together, or the accounting office, and he gives me this book. He says, you know, I don't understand it. So I'm looking at this book, and I see all these checks listed, 
no petitions, no categories across. That's like, I don't know what this is. So I, I go call up the, the office of the clerk. I said, well, what is this? He said, well, this is our way to report to you and the people you know, what we're spending in Congress. You know what they were doing? They were listing every check that a congressman spends in his district and in his office, no footings, no cross things, but they thought they were disclosing everything. In other words, you'd have to be, you'd have to have your own calculator to put it together. And that's when I realized that we were in trouble. Here's the Congress of the United States reporting to itself just by listing a check register, and they want you to think that they were reporting to you. That's one of the reasons I became so interested in this and said things have got to change. I was the one who recommended an audit be done. The first one was done by Price Waterhouse, and we know they couldn't do an audit even in the House. It took a couple of years. But look what you just heard from David Walker. Over half of the information in this book is unauditable. The Defense Department doesn't have a set of books that we can audit. And it's 20 years after we came up with this principle. And one of the things that you're trying to do is get the information out faster to the public. That may be a mistake. Maybe we need to get better information out to the public and take a little more time. Because now the cycle has been reduced. It used to be nine months, I think, before your financial statement was out. Now it's down to six or three. I forget the new, new amount. But 45 days. 45 days. Well, can anybody do an audit in 45 days, especially in a system where we know the books are in shambles, especially in some of the biggest agencies? So we have a basic problem. You need to have audits of this. You need to have independent audits. Why not a, a, a conference or an association of outside accountants hired by the United States of America to do this so the people know this is being prepared by a third party? It's objective. It's fair. OK, I think I could go on and on, but you want to have lunch. I want some questions. If you have them, I'd be happy to answer questions. But you have my book. You have my report. You have my card. And you're going to see a lot of me.